Good morning. Day two. Day two. We made it through day one, all right. Day two. Breakfast was good this morning? Did you get plenty of starch? All right, good. No, not enough. Well, then we'll feed you lunch and dinner. And you'll end up, most of you end up losing a little weight. It's like when we go to Costa Rica. We feed people all day long, I mean, tables of food. And they all promise me by the second day that they're going to gain weight. And I say, fine. Write me when you get home. Tell me. Well, there have been a couple of people who came very stealth thin. Uh, a couple of people came starving themselves. They gained one or two pounds. But almost everybody loses four or five pounds, even eating as much as they want. Why? Because this is a starch-based diet. Now, <clears throat> somebody asked me last night. We were sitting at the table. They'd heard other speakers say, well, starch is okay if you're really, really physically active. You know, you're, you're a laborer. You work out all the time. You run marathons. It's okay to eat starch. Well, how about the other folks? Remember I said there are 1.73 billion Asians, and nobody's overweight as long as they live on a rice-based diet. And some of those Asians are school teachers, and they're ministers, and they're painters, and uh, housewives. And, you know, they're rather sedentary, yet nobody's overweight. And I find that. I mean, I've been at this for 35 years. People stick to the diet. They stick to a starch-based diet. They stay trim. I mean, if you want to really look good, I mean, like rippling muscles and uh, uh, not, not, you know, not, a, not a, a layer of fat on you, you've got to put some work into it. <clears throat> but if you just want to look like a regular person, maybe with a little bit of storage for some time when you do get sick, you know, an extra three, four, or five pounds, all you have to do is eat the food. Folks, it's the food. I promise you it's the food. And uh, people will, will come to these programs, they'll come to these weekends, and I can I'll point some figures at a few of them here. But they'll come to these weekends, and all of a sudden, they'll walk up to me and they'll say, I mean, they've been here three, four, five times. I finally heard you. I finally heard I'm supposed to eat starch. <laughs> it's not a vegetarian diet. It's not a vegan diet. It's not a diet of salads. It's not olive oil. I'm supposed to eat starch. And then once they get that, and everything works. The weight loss works, they feel good, the energy's there, the blood pressure comes down, because starch is our diet. We are starch eaters. Always have been, always will be, that's never going to change. Now the story I have to tell you this morning is rather complex, but you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a teacher, and I think I can get all these concepts across to you, but you have to pay very close attention. This is very uh, essential information, not just for the topic at hand, but for all areas of health. I bet by the time we get done, you'll recognize the problems I'm talking about and many, many people that you know. This story begins when I was um, a medical resident in Honolulu in 1977. I was on neurology service, and one of my jobs was to give grand rounds. I was asked to present an hour-long discussion about some topic in neurology. <coughs> By that time, I had already had the plantation experience. I had uh, lived on the plantation on the Big Island, the sugar plantation. I would had a chance to observe my first, second, third, and fourth generation Filipinos, Japanese, Chinese, and Koreans. And I saw that my first generation, those folks who were raised in Japan, the Philippines, China, learned to diet of rice and vegetables, were always trim, always active, never had breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer. Uh, they lived in their 80s and 90s and you know, died of old age. Which, by the way, what's dying of old age? I mean, it's so, so seldom it happens these days. Dying of old age is you just kind of go to sleep at night, and the heart fails, and you're drowned in your own fluids. It's a peaceful death. Yeah. But anyway, that's, that's what they died. They died of old age. <laughs> you have to die sometime. And then I'm taking care of the second, third, and fourth generation people. The second generation, you know, they kind of learned to eat from mom and dad, and then they got uh, into more of the rich foods. We didn't have McDonald's. In fact, the first McDonald's arrived in 1972 in Hilo, Hawaii, and I was one of their first customers. <laughs> I hadn't had a McDonald's in probably six months, and I got Mary in our, uh, in our Toyota Land Rover, and I said, we're going. <laughs> I need that double cheeseburger. And we got down there and uh, established a good relationship with McDonald's. But we had Texas drive in and we had a, you know, a few other places where people could get richer foods. And so the second generation, they ate a little more rich food. They still stayed pretty trim, pretty healthy. Third generation, they really got into it. Uh, they really got into the American diet, the banded traditional ways, and they got fat and sick. And so that's how I learned about, about a good diet. I learned it from my patients. I learned almost everything I know today from my patients during the three years I spent between 1970 
uh, let's see, it was 1973 and 1976 on the Big Island of Hawaii, working with uh, my sugar plantation patients. So it was right there in front of me. You know, you eat rice and vegetables, first generation. You're trim, healthy, hardy. You avoid all the diseases that I was taught to treat. You switch over to the rich Western diet, you get fat and sick. I mean, this is a big, a big jump. You know, this is, this is an observation anybody couldn't make. Well, anyway, I, I went back to residency. I was a family practitioner there. I'd delivered 100 babies. I'd uh, taken people who had scraped their heads across the highway and done brain surgery on them. I, I'd done basically everything, because I was the doctor. The nearest specialist was 41 miles away. But I wasn't a happy doctor. I wasn't a happy doctor because my patients weren't getting well. Sure, those who broke bones, I could straighten the bones out. Sure, those that got big gashes, I could sew the gashes up. I'd give some antibiotics and help with some problems there. That was good. That made me feel real good. But when it came to most of my patients, those with chronic disease, like your friends and neighbors, the way you used to be, chronic problems like chronic obesity, Chronic high blood pressure, chronic diabetes, chronic arthritis. Chronic, chronic, chronic. As Dr. Deal mentioned, chronic means it never stops. It always goes on. And I was taught I was God, next to God. Not real God, but next to God. I was a doctor. You know, I was a doctor. So I was supposed to heal everything. And I took a look at my patients and looked at what I was doing, passing out these pills and sending them off to heart surgery and so on. I, I looked at my accomplishments and I said, well, I'm not a very good God. You know, this is not working. <laughs> I'm a lousy doctor, is what I thought. So I went back into training, and I went to the University of Hawaii Medical Residency Training Program. And that's where, on my service in neurology, I was asked to give <clears throat> an hour-long presentation to the staff about some topic in neurology. Well, I was already fascinated with food. And so I went to the library, and I started looking, about, looking for any relationship between neurologic diseases and food. And almost immediately, I came across the work of one of my most important mentors. Those of you who know me know that what I teach is not original. Uh, and some of you think, may think this is McDougal diet. McDougal, McDougal discovered all this stuff. This is, I hate to break your bubble, but this is not true. There are many people who discovered this long before me, and they were my mentors, and I stand on their shoulders very solidly. And I'm going to talk to you about one of my most important mentors during this presentation. So anyway, I started learning about the relationship between a diet and multiple sclerosis. You would never think, multiple sclerosis, I mean, what a mysterious disease. Nobody, nobody knows, nobody would even dare think that, that they knew the cause of multiple sclerosis, much less, much less the, the way to treat multiple sclerosis. This is like, this, this would be a heresy in medicine. You'd be an instant quack if you made that kind of association. Multiple sclerosis, you may have heard the term, you may not know what it is, but I'll tell you more about what it is in a minute. So I came back to, uh, to my uh, instructor and I said, I'm gonna do a presentation on diet and multiple sclerosis. And I gave an hour long presentation on diet and multiple sclerosis based on primarily the work of my mentor that I'm gonna talk to you about in just a minute. Got done with that presentation and asked for questions. The one question was, well, how do you know that you're not saving these people from heart disease? How do you know that they're saving them from multiple sclerosis? You should, couldn't be just saving them from heart disease. You see, when multiple sclerosis patients eat a healthier diet, they live longer. That was the only criticism. I said, I'll take it. <laughs> what do I care what I save them from? <laughs> Fact is, is my patients, you know, the patients treated by my mentor were living phenomenally long, a normal lifespan when other multiple sclerosis patients were dying very young, and I'll show you how fast they, drive, they die. So, yeah, maybe I was saving them from heart disease or type 2 diabetes or breast cancer or so on, but uh, uh, with that kind of diet, the kind of diet I'm teaching you, definitely they are saved. All right. Let me take you to another chapter in this story. <clears throat> About six uh, years ago, Mary and I set up a 501c3 tax-deductible corporation. It's the McDougal Research and Education Foundation. And there are people in this room that have generously donated to that foundation. And we raised over $700,000. And it's still growing. And by the way, remember the money I saved you last night? I saved you $4,000. And then I gave you a dollar. And then Hans Deal told you how to get off all your expensive medication. Now you got all that money. And then when you learn about vitamin supplements and how they kill you, you got all that money. You wonder what to do with that money? It's called the McDougal Research and Education Foundation. You just send it. You know, we'll even come pick it up because it's going to be so much. Anyways, we raised all this money, and, uh, and I told Mary I'd like to spend the money on uh, 
studying the benefits of diet and multiple sclerosis. She said, why? She says, you know, there aren't, aren't very many people with multiple sclerosis, maybe 350,000 people in the U.S. with MS. Let's pick something big, like heart disease. You know, even arthritis. Well, I already did a study on arthritis and diet, I told her. Published that. Uh, you know, breast cancer. Now I said, I'm going to do it on diet and multiple sclerosis. And the reason is this. I want to take the biggest rock I can find and I want to throw it at the biggest picture window in town. And when that glass shatters, it's going to wake up every doctor in the country. Because if I can stop multiple sclerosis with a simple diet of potatoes and rice and corn, then they're going to say that kind of diet can stop anything. So that's what uh, I decided, Mary and I decided to do is to dedicate our primary research dollars to treating diet and multiple sclerosis. And I teamed up with uh, Oregon Health and Science University. Oregon Health and Science University is the medical school in Oregon. But that's too long of a name, so I call it the medical school in Portland. <laughs> happens to be where my son right now is in uh, residency training at Oregon Health and Science University. So we started a study about uh, four years ago. <clears throat> This saga has a, an end and it has a beginning. The end of the saga is when my mentor died. He died November 16, 2008. His name was Roy Swank. Roy Swank, MD. Very famous man because of other things that he'd done, but also because of multiple sclerosis. He died at age 99. He was my friend, as well as my mentor. I got to know him by uh, traveling through Portland, many times selling books. I was a book salesman for a long time, and I got to go to TV shows, and radio shows, and sell my books. And every time I did, I'd stop in to see uh, Dr. Swank. And uh, we'd just sit and talk in his basement, and he'd tell me about his life, and his work, and his research, and so on. And I was eventually invited, to, uh, when the Multiple Sclerosis Society honored him, I was invited to give a keynote address for, for that particular evening. And I met lots of his patients. I met several hundred of his patients. And uh, so I knew him for a long time. Well, he died at age 99. Before he died, we actually signed a legal agreement. That says basically, I'm allowed to continue on with his work. So I told Mary, another reason I'm going to do this study is because I have a debt that I want to pay back, and that's to my mentor who taught me so much. The saga begins anew when the Institutional Review Board that's the ethics board of the medical school in Portland when they approved their study of diet and multiple sclerosis. It took them a year to decide it was safe to feed people potatoes. <laughs> Honest to goodness. They thought we were doing something unethical to feed people lasagna and oatmeal. But after a year, after a year, January 15, 2009, we were approved and so we were on the road and uh, starting patients. The study is set up uh, as, as well designed as you can possibly do. It's a, it's a blinded study, a single blinded study, randomized controlled study. You know, it's just tops. The people who are doing the investigation, they're, they're really good at research. And when it gets published, it's going to make a statement, to say the least. In fact, uh, I don't have complete agreement on it yet, but the head of the neurology department, Dennis Bordet, is likely going to be one of our speakers in our next February advanced study weekend right here on this stage. <clears throat> when I uh, uh, proposed the study to the neurology department, Dr. Bordet and Dr. Yadav, I sent them a letter. And I said, uh, you know, there are three things I want, only three things. Just, you know, half-page letter. I said, first of all, every study that we publish will include the recognition of Dr. Roy Swank in the introduction and the discussion. Every study. Number two is I get to educate all the patients. Because that's the failing of most dietary studies, is, is the educators teach uh, uh, wishy-washy diets, you know. Eat a little chicken, a little skim milk, you know, cut down on your desserts. Eh, nothing's going to make any difference. And that's why the dietary studies usually don't show anything. I said, I'm going to teach them. And I'm going to teach them right here at this facility. And so <clears throat> people sign up for the study. It's a randomized uh, study. You got a, a flip of the coin, essentially, as to whether you're going to continue to eat the Western diet for another year, or you're going to come here and get educated. 
Now, after a year, after a year of being, you know, eating the meat and the cheese and so on and so on, then you can come here and we'll teach you the diet. We actually had a lady in the last program who was in tears when I gave this lecture. She was so upset that we'd allow her, knowing what we know, allow her to continue to eat the diet that was eating away at her brain for a year because she was in the control group. And I felt for her. And I really do, th I have some concerns of this being unethical to do this. But unfortunately, that's what you have to do with a study. You know, you take one group and you make a change. That's a change to this kind of eating. And then you let the other group continue in their ways. And that's what we've been doing for a year with these people, over a year. And then the third thing I said to Dr. To Dr. Bordet is this. My name will not appear on that paper, any paper published. In the methodology, you'll tell them what they did. But you will not have my name in the title. The reason is, is if my name's in the title, people will look at the paper and they'll go, oh, well, that was a big Dougal diet crazy things. <laughs> now, it's not going to happen. This is too important to work. Now, I don't think anybody has ever refused to be principal author on a paper before. But I did for those reasons, because I want it done. I want it done right. I want to throw the biggest rock I can find at the biggest window in town. Dr. Swank. <clears throat> Dr. Swank, when I was, uh, well, let's see, uh, I, was, I was 12 years old. He wrote this in a book. He wrote, uh, gluttony and chronic degenerative diseases have been linked in the minds of both laymen and scientists for many years. The saying, to dig your grave with your teeth, probably has its origins in, antiqu in antiquity, but in the prosperous areas of the Western world during the past few decades, the maxim has taken on real and tragic meaning. It's 1959. That's 50 years ago. This is, this is no new knowledge. Dr. Swank knew all the things that I know. Multiple sclerosis. Exciting disease if you get multiple sclerosis. One day you may wake up and an eye doesn't work. Next day you may wake up and you can't hold your urine. Well, a few months later you might wake up and your bowels don't work. Another month or two later you might wake up and leg doesn't work. Oh, you never know what's going to happen. It's like, it's like an inexpert marksman stood back and shot at your nervous system. Now, wherever those bullets hit, a piece of the nervous system goes. The damage is horrendous. There's a little healing that goes on after the damage, but by, by, by and large, what you're left with, like after any injury, is you're left with scar tissue. And you can see that scar tissue uh, when you do tests. When you do uh, MRI tests, you can see scars, these, like this little hole here, this little hole here. You see these, these scars, these are, <clears throat> these are called plaques. We do some contrast material with them too so you can enhance these plaques. So you can see where the nervous system is attacked. And wherever it's attacked, whatever that nervous system supplies is, is out of function. And a lot of it stays permanently out of function. Now, doctors divide, doctors like to divide things. They like to divide things and name things. Like, for example, if you've got arthritis, the doctor will work real hard to put you in a box. And they have a few tests here, a few tests there, and if you pass those tests and fail those tests, you can put in different boxes. Like uh, if you have a positive rheumatoid factor, you have polyarthritis, you have uh, elevated sedimentation rate, they'll call you a rheumatoid arthritis patient. If you have a positive ANA test, they'll put you in a box called uh, lupus. They put you in all these little boxes. You go, oh, thank God, doctor, you know what's wrong with me. Uh, yeah, yeah, we know what's wrong with you. Everybody feels better. But the thing is, is regardless of what little box you're in, the doctor will say, we don't know what causes it. You put on the same kind of drugs, regardless of what little box you're in, and your disease progresses in the same way it would be if it was untreated. Regardless of what box you're in, but people feel good about doctors knowing particulars about your problem. So what doctors have done is they've classified multiple sclerosis into two types. One type is called the relapsing remitting. That means you have attacks and then you seem to heal a bit and you seem to be better. Another type is just progressive multiple sclerosis. You just, you just keep going downhill, downhill, downhill. Well, really they're the same disease. It's just that those with the progressive disease skip the relapsing remitting phase. And those in the relapsing remaining phase, they just go on to progressive disease in a large number of cases. It's the same problem. But by distinguishing, I guess it gives the doctors and the patients a sense that we really have a handle on this. It's one disease, multiple sclerosis. 
The treatment, let's talk about the treatments for a minute. This borders on criminal behavior, what goes on here. Uh, this is probably one reason I shouldn't have my name on the scientific paper. Because when I say things like that, not only do people get upset about my behavior of eating a vegetarian diet, but they're also concerned about their pocketbook when I talk about the treatment of multiple sclerosis. Let me show you the best that they can do. The best they can do with the drugs. There's several drugs used. Uh, Bear Shearing Pharmaceutical, this is their test. They paid for it. This is uh, their drugs, which are interferon, beta interferon. The absolute advantage for slowing disability with the use of the most popular medication, which is beta interferon, is clinically small, 8% reduction in disability in three years, 8%. Well, that's like 2% a year compared to people who don't get the drug. That's the best. I'm showing you the best. Okay. Now let me show you what really goes on. Uh, <clears throat> this is a report that was just published two months ago. It was published in the British Medical Journal. It was about the scheme. I didn't make up the name. It's about the scheme. Okay. The multiple sclerosis risk sharing scheme. I mean, don't you just love that scheme? Scheme? I love it, scheme, but that's what they called it. In 2002, uh, uh, the National Institute of, of Health and Clinical Excellence, which is the, uh, the overseeing body for medical care in the United Kingdom, they said, we're not going to pay for multiple sclerosis drugs because they don't work and they hurt patients and they're costly. Costly, I mean, these drugs cost $30,000 a year just for the drug. So they said, we're not going to pay for it. Well, the doctors got upset, the patients got upset, Drug companies got upset. Everybody got upset. And so the uh, National Institutes of Health and Clinical Excellence, the group says, OK, we'll make a deal. It's just a scheme. The scheme is this. We'll pay for the drugs based upon their value, based upon their benefits. So they uh, followed the patients treated with these drugs, glad gladivir and beta interferon. They followed these patients until 2009. This started in 2002, until 2009. And then they uh, got the reports together and finally made the statements uh, two months ago about what was going on. And what they discovered is that the patients taking the disease-modifying treatments had acquired more disability than an untreated historical control group. In other words, they compared those who got the drugs and those who didn't, those who got the drugs did worse. So, the National Health Service said the manufacturers would need to pay the National Health Service to use the drugs. <laughs> that, was, that was the agreement. We'd pay based upon the effectiveness, and the end results are if we're going to use these drugs in, in Britain, in England, if we're going to use these drugs based upon the effectiveness, you guys have to pay us to treat the patients because they do more harm than good. It's called the scheme. Uh, the use of medications in the United Kingdom, these kinds of drugs are used in 10 to 15 percent of the patients. In the United States, 55 to 70 percent of the patients are on these useless, harmful, expensive drugs. That's the power of the drug companies. The data is clear. At best, 2 percent per year decrease in disability. And in this particular study, they ended up worse. There's such a show going on. It's unbelievable. But it's money. It's just money. I mean, there's nothing personal about this. You have to understand, it's nothing personal. It's not like somebody doesn't like you. This is just business. Do you get it? It's just, it really is just business. Oh, yeah. All right. Let's talk about uh, multiple sclerosis. You kind of got it. This isn't a fun disease to get. Uh, it occurs more in women. Common age of having multiple sclerosis is in your 30s. And another thing that we notice about multiple sclerosis is, uh, and I, I was taught this in medical school. So were you, if you were in medical school or a nurse. You were taught this too. You were taught that multiple sclerosis is rare around the equator and as you move away from the equator to the poles it becomes common. Yeah, you were taught that. And I thought, aha, magnetic fields. <laughs> That's what it is, magnetic field. And believe me, nobody stopped me. Nobody said, nobody said uh, you're wrong. My son was taught the same thing when he went through medical school a couple of years ago. Well, you'll love my son when you get to meet him. He's just like, he's just like his dad, except he's under control. And he's, <laughs> and he's very, very effective, extremely effective. And he's angry, too. 
Every time we talk, he gets more and more angry. And I tell him, son, you just got to you just got to bide your time. You got to understand what everything's going on. He, because he goes up to his mentors, his teachers. He says, why are we doing this to our patients? I want the evidence that says what you're asking me to do to my patients is helping them. And none of them will give him the evidence. And then he'll go get the evidence. He'll say, look, it, it, this obviously doesn't help my patients. Why are we doing this? So he's, he's in a bit of a, of a tangle at the medical school in Portland, let's say. And I even told him a couple of days ago, I said, you know, you don't want to lose your job. He says, I'm too good. I won't lose it. <laughs> See that cocky attitude he has? <laughs> you wonder where he got that? <laughs> anyway, I, I don't think he will either because he's very careful, very smart. Anyway, they were taught this same, same stuff. You get away from the poles, uh, it becomes more common. No, no, why? All right, new theory comes up. New theory, and that is uh, one that I'd like to give you a whole lecture on. It's about uh, vitamin D, sunlight. So what uh, the theory is now <clears throat> is the reason that we have all kinds of diseases is because we don't get enough sun. Now let me just make a, a quick statement about this. It's very, very, very important you get sunshine. Absolutely crucial. I do not prescribe vitamin D pills. They are dangerous. They are ineffective. What people need is sunshine. Crucial. But the theory is, when it comes to multiple sclerosis, is because it's rare around the equator, it's vitamin D that makes a difference. Which, of course, we're talking about sunshine. Vitamin D is a sunshine vitamin. But that translates into medication, always. You know, you get an idea, it translates into drugs. Why? Well, obviously, there's money in drugs, and people don't want to go out in the sun. They'd rather take drugs. So it doesn't work, just like the other things. You know, you take statins. Well, my cholesterol's down, and I didn't have to change my diet. Okay, so here we go. So low vitamin D levels, they say, as we go up north and south, that's, that's why we get multiple sclerosis. Treating multiple sclerosis with vitamin D has never been shown of any benefit. It's a, it's a really, it's a loose theory. It's really a theory that just supports a confounding factor. This confounding factor is very important for you to understand. Even if we're talking about the relationship of heart disease and vitamin D, or breast cancer and vitamin D, or type 1 and type 2 diabetes and vitamin D, all these relationships you've heard about. How many of you got vitamin D tests in this room? Hey, oh, I don't know, 30. How many of you passed it? <laughs> Two. <laughs> Well, it does mean you need, to be, you need to get more sunshine, but the, the test is really, as far as I'm concerned, designed to sell drugs. But anyway, so as you, as you move away from the equator, you get less sunshine, and it's also associated with more of all of these diseases we talked about, including multiple sclerosis. It's, it's because of a confounding factor, and that's this. As you move away from the equator, you change your diet. People who eat in this area of the planet are on starch-based diets. I know that's changing, but traditionally, up until the last few years, they've been living on diets of various grains and potatoes and so on. As you move away from the equator, your diet becomes dairy and meat. That's the problem with heart disease, multiple sclerosis, breast cancer, etc. That's the problem. It's not some magnetic field. There's a whole bunch of information about uh, the connection of multiple sclerosis and the cow. Cow's milk. Cow's milk is uh, saturated fat. Saturated fat is the kind of fat that we can make. Uh, unsaturated fat, some of it is essential fats. Essential, in other words, we can't make it, we've got to get it from our diet, and those essential fats go to build our nervous system. When you're fed a diet that is high in saturated fat, it has to be low in unsaturated fats or essential fats, so you're basically raised on a diet deficient in essential fatty acids, so you can't build a strong nervous system because you don't have the components in your food, like when you're raised on infant formulas or cow's milk as a little baby. These are f essential fatty acid deficient diets. So you, so you lay the foundation in your myelin, which are the, the, the sheaths that cover your nerves, you lay a, a poor foundation, a poor structure in there, and then something happens later in life. It could be a virus, could be an autoimmune reaction, could be a circulatory reaction. Something happens. We know that multiple sclerosis lesions are perivascular. If you look at the pathology, you look at the brain of somebody who's had an MS attack, the, the injury is right around the blood vessel. So something in that blood vessel that's taking place and it takes place on the foundation of a deficiently developed nervous system because little kids are raised on cow's milk. All right, Dr. Swank, let's get back to him. 
Dr. Swank wrote this paper in 1954. Oh, I was seven years old. This is, this is the classic paper on multiple sclerosis. Let me just read the title. Intervascular Aggregation and Adhesiveness of Blood Elements Associated with Alimentary Lipemia and Injection of Large Molecular Substances. All right, what does that mean? That means if you eat fat, your blood sticks together. Yeah. And uh, I just want to lay a little foundation for you here. What happens, uh, Dr. Zwank's theory of how multiple sclerosis uh, attacks occur is this. We eat a high-fat diet, and this means vegetable fat, animal fat, a high-fat diet. In his case, it was mostly animal fat that he was focused on, saturated fat. What happens is all that fat gets into the bloodstream, and it coats your, the blood cells. Now, blood cells, they have a, a negatively charged membrane so that like magnets, when you put the negative poles together, they repel each other. The same pole together, they repel each other. So they have these charged membranes. They, when a cell, when one blood cell approaches the other, they bounce off. They don't, they don't stick together. Otherwise, it would, the blood would have a hard time circulating if you didn't have this natural repulsion. When you eat fat, what happens is the fat coats the cells so that they lose this ability to repel, and so they stick together and clump, they aggregate. And big aggregations, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about the aggregation of blood elements due to fat, lipemia. 1954, he wrote this. All right, uh, let's see if you can hear this, listen carefully, pay close attention. I would like you to meet Dr. Swank. Early in the 50, early 50s, because we became interested in fat in this disease, we started studying the effect of fat on the circulation. We were using dogs and humans and uh, hamsters at that time. And what we found was that uh, after three hours after a large butterfat meal, you'd find the red cells starting to clump up. And in the hamster, you could, where we studied the live circulation, you could watch the circulation slowing down and sometimes stopping for a period. And so we began to think in terms that this abnormality in the plasma, which we had become suspicious of being present. We began to think that there must be something in the, which is missing in MS, or which is abnormal in MS, which prevents this clumping, and that this clumping in MS is, causes damage to the capillary system of the brain. And this destroys what we know as the blood-brain barrier. Here's the uh, blood flow uh, prior to any meal. You can keep the lights down a little bit. Blood flow prior to any meal. You see uh, nice even circulation. There it is in a big blood vessel. That's prior to any, eating any meal. And then you feed the fat, and the fat coats the cells. And after the fat coats the cells, they can't repel. Instead, they hit, stick, form clumps. This is called Rouleau formation. You see the sludging of the blood. This takes place in every capillary in the body. The oxygen tension in the blood drops by 20%. But what he's saying is when this happens in the nervous system, this, this low blood supply, the drop in oxygen that occurs, he's saying that that disturbs the blood-brain barrier, the blood-brain barrier. So the, the, the barrier between the blood and the nervous system broken down so that things can get into the nervous system that wouldn't otherwise be allowed. But because of this change in circulation, they are allowed to occur. This takes place in all parts of the body. And... Uh, this has also been shown in, uh, in people to occur. Now, let me uh, take a moment. I'd like to uh, take a, a little divergence here on this topic and broaden it a little bit. And I want to talk to you about autoimmune diseases because that's what multiple sclerosis is. All, all, multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disease. It's where the body attacks itself. And because of the breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, Things, are, things, and those things are, are antibodies, are allowed to get into the nervous system and attack parts of the nervous system called the myelin. But this happens with many, many other diseases, and that's why I want to make this a generalized discussion for you. Your gut, your gut is a uh, small intestine, is very long, let's see, it's probably about 20, about 20 feet long. And uh, to make absorption of nutrients uh, very effective, the, the intestine is folded. Uh, to, to give you a larger surface area, and these are called villi. You can see them under a microscope. This is just this is the wall of the small intestine. 
And if you notice, these villi have one cell here, coating all these villi. Okay? And then after you, whatever it is in the gut, the stuff, food, whatever is in the gut, after it goes through this one cell, then it can get into the bloodstream. This cell layer is extremely important, and it's very smart. This, they, these cells are so smart that when you eat, it can determine that the proteins that you eat should be allowed to get into your body to provide for your protein needs. But the proteins you eat, like that are bacteria or viruses, it can tell those are bad proteins and it won't let them into your body, normally and naturally. It can discriminate amongst various kinds of proteins. But these cells are so, so smart. They, they determine uh, how many minerals get into your body. For example, if you eat a low calcium diet, there's no such thing as a too low calcium diet because no one has ever developed dietary calcium deficiency based on a natural low calcium diet. It's never happened. You eat a lower calcium diet, say uh, potatoes and rice and corn, and you skip the milk and the Tums. The, the, those cells just get, they get very smart. They know there's, there's something going on there. They know they've got to be more efficient. They just absorb more calcium. You do something stupid, like take a uh, hands full of Tums and drink glassfuls of milk, those cells will block that calcium so it doesn't get into your bloodstream and doesn't calcify your soft tissues, like your heart and your kidneys and your muscles, and you die. That's how smart those cells are. That one cell layer. Those cells are so smart that if you develop iron deficiency anemia, they will know your body's deficient in, in, in iron, and it will increase the absorption of iron up to 20% of the iron you eat will now be absorbed because the body, those cells know the body needs more iron. Otherwise, if your iron's sufficient, those cells will not allow that iron into the body. If the iron got into the body at its own free will, it would uh, deposit in your kidneys, or excuse me, in your liver, in your spleen. You get hemosiderosis, and you die. You die from iron t intoxication. That's how smart those cells are. Life or death. What happens is this, is those cells get injured. They get injured by the foods that we eat. They get injured uh, by the drugs we take. They get injured by viruses. And what happens is a, a whole layer of these cells will be denuded, will be missing. And so you don't have cells to make this discrimination. And then what happens is substances can leak through into the bloodstream without, without the knowledge and the discrimination of these blood cells. This is called a leaky gut, a leaky gut. One of the more common ways to get a leaky gut is to take non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, Advil, Motrin. You take these kinds of drugs, on a regular basis, it can take up to four months to grow this, this barrier back. Of course, the standard treatment for autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis is to take non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Yeah, okay. All right. Let me just kind of tell you how you might think about this. Remember drinking a hot beverage? You drink a hot beverage and uh, it kind of burns and you, you, kind of, you feel inside your mouth and, and you look in there and you go, oh, there's, it's just kind of red. Well, that's that one cell layer that's missing. They say it shouldn't be that painful. It's just a little hot cup of tea. But it's very, very painful. It's that one cell that got denuded. So you've got these denuded patches all the way from the beginning of the intestinal system to the, to the end. But uh, primarily, this is all taking, in, taking place in the small intestine. All right. So you, the first step in creating an autoimmune disease is to uh, destroy some of these cells by what we eat, viruses, toxins, drugs that we take and so on. When foreign substances get into the bloodstream, this is the bloodstream right here, foreign substances get in the bloodstream, the body attacks these foreign substances. Like, like virus coats, this is a virus. A virus coat, it attacks it, attacks it by the lymphocytes making antibodies, and this is how we represent antibodies. The lymphocytes make antibodies that attach to the protein coat and then other cells become involved and kill this virus. That's, you know, that's the life-saving mechanism of the body. Naturally, normally occurs when a virus or a bacteria got in here, the same thing. It would make these, the, the lymphocytes would make antibodies against the bacterial wall coat. And other cells would come in and attack and kill those foreign invaders. That's what's supposed to happen. These are foreign invaders invading proteins. Well, if you have a uh, leaky gut, in other words, that one cell layer has been destroyed in your gut, then 
proteins can get into your bloodstream that shouldn't be there. Uh, like, for example, beef protein can get in there. Uh, cow is not supposed to be running around in your bloodstream. And when the body sees cow running around in the bloodstream, what it says is this is a foreign substance. This, is, this, is a, uh, this could be a bacteria. This could be a, a, this could be a virus. I might, must make antibodies against it, and so it makes antibodies against the cow, against the cow beef proteins. It happens with pork. It happens with uh, most animal foods. Well, it may happen with plant foods too, but it's not very rare, not very commonly. Even if it is, it's not really important, and I'll tell you why it's not important in a second. Uh, same thing with uh, milk products. Milk products are particularly notorious. The beta casein uh, uh, protein in cow's milk is, is very notorious for uh, causing these kinds of reactions where the beta casein from the milk leaks through, the leaky gut gets in the bloodstream, the body says, hey, this is a virus, I've got to make an antibody against it. Here's where the problem comes. The body makes antibodies against beef, pork, dairy proteins. And these antibodies that it makes against these proteins, they find similar proteins in our body. The process is called molecular mimicry. Mimicry as in copy. They find similar proteins. Like, for example, this antibody attacks a segment on beta casein, 17 amino acids that we've identified. 17 amino acids on this beta casein. It takes, and this is like a key in a lock. It comes and attacks it. The milk protein uh, st stimulated that reaction because it's a foreign protein. It's not supposed to be in there. So it stimulated that reaction to cause the production of very specific antibodies that fit like a lock and key right into that section of beta casein. Milk is animal. Beef is animal. Pork is animal. People is animal. See? We have similar proteins in our body. So what happens is this, is there are similar proteins that you would find on the beta casein molecule of the, uh, of the milk that are present in cells in the pancreas. This is the pancreas. And part of this pancreas is made up of cells called beta cells. These are insulin-producing cells. And as a result, when these foreign protein or these antibodies are made against this foreign protein beta casein, they find these same proteins, they say in this case, these same 17 amino acids on that pancreas, and they go and they attack that as if it were the cow's milk, that foreign substance. Molecular mimicry, mimicry, copy, copy. It's a copy found here that's also on the foreign protein, the milk. And so the antibodies attack to these insulin producing cells, and they kill the cells. It, it takes about three to five years in general to kill enough cells in the pancreas so that the patient becomes type 1 diabetic. And by the way, type 1 diabetes is termed childhood diabetes, but actually half the people get this disease after the age of 18. So adults get type 1 diabetes too. If, um, you know, we're dealing with all kinds of problems. There are, there are all kinds of autoimmune diseases, and they work by a similar mechanism, molecular mimicry. Uh, there's problems like uh, ankylosing spondylitis, Crohn's disease, uh, dermatomyositis, that's uh, where it attacks the, the bones and the skin, type 1 diabetes, inflammatory arthritis. We've identified, we've identified the proteins in the cartilages that look exactly the same as the proteins in the cow's milk. We've identified proteins in our artery walls, in the lining of our artery walls, the intima, that also are represented in the cow's milk protein. You know, so somebody's got heart disease, worried about dying of a heart attack, had a heart attack, had an angioplasty, et cetera. They say, okay, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to, I'm going to give up the fat. I'm going to just go to skim milk. Well, skim milk is all dairy protein, a little lactose. So you're still eating all these dairy proteins. So the dairy proteins come in. You've got a leaky gut. The dairy protein goes into the uh, bloodstream. The body makes antibodies to a segment of the dairy protein. A segment of amino acids on that dairy protein that's also represented on the intima of the <laughs> artery lining, and it goes and attacks that artery lining. The people with the worst atherosclerosis, the rottenest arteries, if you measure the antibodies in their blood against cow, cow's milk, you find they have the highest levels of antibodies to cow's milk in their blood. 
So you, you got to give up skim milk too. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Uh, lupus, multiple sclerosis. We're, we're going to talk about more pernicious anemia, polymyositis, psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. Now that's where it attacks the it attacks the joints. That's that's why Phyllis Hafey, you know, she she just changed her diet. And what happened initially when she changed her diet is the cow milk proteins stopped going into the bloodstream, so she stopped making antibodies against the cow milk proteins, which were attacking her, her joints. And then as time went on, her leaky gut healed, especially after she stopped the Motrin, the Advil, and other, other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs that she was on. Uh, scleroderma thyroiditis. Somebody asked me about thyroiditis last night. Thyroiditis is called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Uh, Japanese guy named Hashimoto in 1917 described it. That's why its name is associated with it. Every doctor you see, if you go in with low thyroid, every doctor you see will say you have autoimmune thyroiditis. And they can find antibodies to the thyroid in your blood, and they do measure them often. And everybody knows this. This is this is nothing that is a particular knowledge of mine. Every doctor you see will tell you the same story. You have autoimmune thyroiditis. Your body is attacking your thyroid. And you say, why is the body attacking my thyroid, doctor? Why do I have these antibodies against my thyroid, doctor? Now, I have to tell you, for the next few sentences, I'm making all of this up. <laughs> Everything else I've told you is all solid science, but I'm going to make this story up for you. Why would the body attack its thyroid gland? Well, it needs to come in contact, the foreign protein from the food needs to go through this leaky gut into the bloodstream. The body needs to see this foreign protein, this foreign thyroid protein, and make antibodies against a foreign thyroid protein. It can't be too foreign. No, it's got to be like an animal thyroid protein. And it makes antibodies against this animal thyroid protein. And once it makes its antibodies, it goes around looking for that uh, animal thyroid protein. But in the process, it finds human thyroid protein. It attacks it and kills it. Now, where would you get animal thyroid protein. Where do you get that? <coughs> Hot dogs? Lunch meats? I mean, what are these things made of? This is, this is the, the, the waste of the slaughterhouse. They take the tails and the vaginas and the scrotums and the lips and the thyroid glands and they grind them all up and they put them in these lunch meats and hot dogs. And so you eat these things. And so eat, you eat these foreign thyroids. You know, they're foreign. They're from a pig or a cow. The body recognizes them foreign. It makes antibodies against these proteins. Those same segments of amino acids that are on that foreign protein are also represented on your thyroid. 40% of women in middle age have Hashimoto's thyroiditis and are hypothyroid. This is a common thing to do. Okay, that's the end of the made-up story. But I think that really is true. <laughs> Uh, ulcerative colitis, uveitis, where they attack the eye, uh, vitiligo, where you lose the pigment in your skin. These are all autoimmune diseases. And they all occur by similar mechanism. Glomerulonephritis, that's another one I didn't put up there. That's where the body attacks the kidneys. <coughs> when it comes to multiple sclerosis, uh, we have a myelin sheath. This is the nerve. There's a sheath, myelin sheath. It's protein. What happens is uh, foreign proteins, cow milk protein. I mean, that's what's been identified in animal studies. Cow milk protein gets through the leaky gut into the bloodstream. The body makes antibodies to a segment of that cow milk protein. Dr. Swank told you the blood-brain barrier gets damaged, which is the second step that has to take place, possibly through the circulatory changes that take place. The anoxia, the relatively low supply of oxygen occurs when you sludge the blood. So now the blood-brain barrier is damaged. Now these antibodies that are attacking cow milk protein can get through the blood-brain barrier, and they attack the myelin sheath and kill the myelin sheath. Okay? Multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disease. Everybody knows that. So what induces the autoimmunity? Well, in scientific research, I mean, if you take and you look at type 1 diabetes, which we've done you know, hundreds of studies on showing that it's caused by cow's milk consumption, you compare all the, all the characteristics, the epidemiology, the geographic distribution, the changes in population, the animal studies, you compare type 1 diabetes to multiple sclerosis, you've got essentially identical disease patterns. And so what happens is you've got this myelin sheath covering this nerve, protecting and allowing conduction, and you end up destroying the cells, the myelin sheath cells, oligodendrocytes, 
and uh, you end up with a nervous system that doesn't work. These don't grow back. Uh, this is a, this is one of uh, this is Dr. Swank. This is uh, Donna McFarland, one of the people that I know. I've met I've met hundreds of these patients. Stories all the always the same. Uh, she uh, she told she tells her story. She's one of the Star McDougallers. She said uh, her doctor said she was in the top third worst cases I've ever seen. She was diagnosed in 1989. She's in great shape today. This lady, this lady's fun. This is Deb Tissack. Deb Tissack, she got MS in 1991. Uh, the way it occurred is she had a sudden attack of her, her nerves to her inner ear, her balance, part of her body, the inner ear, the vestibulum. And it was such a bad attack that she essentially fell on the floor and couldn't get up. She was so sick that she could not get in a car to go see a doctor for a month. She just had to, had to lay there. And finally, a month later, her husband was able to get her in the car, took her to the doctor. Her family doctor said, this is way too much for me. You need to go see a specialist. So they went off to the specialist. They saw the neurologist. The neurologist examined Deb, got done with the examination, and um, asked her husband to come in the office. Uh, the guy didn't have the greatest bedside manner, but here's how the story goes. Doctor looks at her husband and her and says, uh, this is where you are right now. You, know, you got this ear problem, you're still walking around, life's pretty good. You got MS. Five years is where you're going to be. You're going to be in a wheelchair. Five more years, you're going to be dead or, or bedridden. There's nothing we can do about it. That's what the doctor told her. There's nothing we can do about it. And that's the course of the disease for at least half the people. So Deb says, no, I'm not going to take that. Uh, she becomes semi-vegetarian in 2000, discovers our diet in 2001, stopped her MS in 2002. This is a picture of Deb now. 2005, she came to the clinic. And here's her MRI scan. MRI scan, you know, we look at those, uh, those lesions, you know, that, that uh, random attack by the marksman of the nervous system. You show these lesions. And it says, uh, let's see, compared to March 29 of 2000, uh, the multiple sclerosis lesions in the brain described above are slightly smaller and do not show any interval increase in size. And, you know, I have several other patients with a similar story. That's, that's why we started the study. So, so we were doing the study. And I have to tell you, you know, I can't report the results of the study, but I have to tell you, the people who have been this, for this program and have changed their diet, they're doing really well. Maybe by the time, maybe by February, when Dr. Dennis Bourdette, who's the head of neurology of that medical school in Portland, when he's here standing on this stage, maybe he'll be able to give you some results. Maybe we'll be able to start reporting some results by then. All right, so what Multiple Sclerosis Society and neurologists and so on, they teach you a well-balanced diet. A well-balanced diet, the American diet, maybe a little more of it. Excuse me, maybe a little less of it. They teach you the American diet and what the results are of this. And nobody likes to hear this. I get fights from patients. I get fights from doctors. I even got a fight from Dr. Burdett when I said it. But this is what the research says. And every time we get in this argument, I just lay the papers down in front of them. I say, well, what do they say? The research says that if you get multiple sclerosis, no matter what treatment you give, I just told you the drugs don't work. The scheme proved it. If you get multiple sclerosis, the risk of be, being able to walk unassisted, wheelchair-bound, bedridden, or dead is 50% in 10 years. All right, so Dr. Swank developed this diet. Let me tell you a little bit about how he developed the, MS, the Swank MS diet. Dr. Swank, uh, his job in World War II was to study the disease patterns in Western Europe. As Dr. Deal talked to you a bit last night, uh, what was discovered was when people were under tremendous stress, they were being shot by Nazi Germans and gassed and taken away from their families. I, I just can't imagine how much stress was going on. They got healthier. You know, much less heart disease, much less type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, fewer new cases of MS. People who had MS stopped having attacks. People with diabetes stopped having complications. They just, I mean, tremendously healthier in this time of great stress. And the reason was, as Dr. Deal told you, is because they had to change their diet. They had to eat, you know, potatoes, and uh, they couldn't eat the butter, they couldn't eat the pork chops, and they had to eat the vegetables. So their health flourished. Well, Dr. Swank saw this. He saw it with MS, and they started looking around the world. They found around the world people ate a starch-based diet, like in Japan. There was no MS. 
rural China, there's no MS. In places in Africa where they ate a healthy diet, there was no MS. There's no, no, there was none. He went to China. I have, I have this great recording. I spent hours with Dr. Swank, and I was fortunate enough to have a, a little camcorder, and I recorded it, which is what you saw there a minute ago and what you're going to see again. I recorded some of these, and they're no, not great technology, but I got them right there. And, and I know exactly what he said because I have it on tape. He told me he was invited to China. He was a very famous man. Invited by the Chinese government to discover, because he's known as the father of MS, Dr. Swank is, to uh, look at the cases of multiple sclerosis in China. What Dr. Swank told me is he said the Chinese government was able to find five cases of MS in the entire country. And he said he doubted, Dr. Swank told me he doubted they were even MS. Five cases. Oh, anyway, Dr. Swank, he, uh, after the war, he went to, uh, to Montreal. And he started uh, the Swank Diet. What he did is he took people who were, had MS, there were people with active disease, put them on a diet that was uh, low in fat, total fat, less than 40 to 50 grams compared to the U.S. Uh, intake of 150, 175 grams. Saturated fat, uh, saturated fat was really important. Saturated fat is basically animal fat. You're talking about eggs, you're talking about uh, cheese, m milk, m meat. That's saturated chicken. That's saturated fat. So he dropped the saturated fat down to 0 to 15 grams compared to the U.S. saturated fat intake of 140 to 165 grams. Polyunsaturated fat, Dr. Swank thought that giving fish oil was good. And um, I had this conversation with Dr. Swank many times about why fish oil was good. And he said, well, he thinks that it uh, makes the diet tastier and keeps the people uh, warmer because they have a little more body fat up here in Portland. I said, well, does it, does it do anything in terms of the disease? No, it doesn't. It's the, getting the saturated fat out that makes the difference. So even though when you hear about the Swank diet, you'll hear, well, Dr. Swank feeds some omega-3 fats to these people. Yeah, but not to have any effect on the disease. Uh, no limits to starches, vegetables, and fruit. That is the Swank diet. Uh, Swank, now, this, this is real important for you to understand this. What Swank did is he published a paper in 1991 in Lancet where he looked at his patients. He looked at his patients that had been studied for 34 years. He looked at their diet and looked at the progression of their disease, and this is what he found. He found that a difference of 8 grams of saturated fat intake daily resulted in a three-fold increased chance of dying of multiple sclerosis. Right, just look at that for a minute because I've got some important things to share with you. 8 grams more saturated fat, three times more risk of dying of multiple sclerosis. What is 8 grams of saturated fat? If you have one sausage a day, that's 10 grams of saturated fat. You increase your risk of dying of multiple sclerosis by threefold. You have uh, one burger, three times the risk of dying of multiple sclerosis. Uh, one porterhouse steak, three times the, a day, just one. Oh, let's see, a chicken McNugget, three times the risk of dying of multiple sclerosis. Uh, a little cheese, three times the risk of dying of multiple sclerosis. A little cheesecake, three times the risk of dying of multiple sclerosis. Now, it's not a lot of this saturated fat you have to eat to change the course of your disease. Or it's not a lot. You've got to get out of your diet to save your life. All right. Let's talk about some of the results of Dr. Swank's diet. Again, I have had many discussions. I was fortunate enough to record some of these discussions. Uh, we talked about the effects of his diet on multiple sclerosis. Remember, any other treatment, within 10 years, half the people are unable to walk unassisted, wheelchair bound, bedridden or dead. I don't care what kind of drug you throw at them. I don't care if you spend $30,000 a year treating them. It doesn't make any difference. They're in huge trouble. So what's Dr. Swank's result? Well, Dr. Swank reports with the Swank diet, relapses decreased by 70% in the first year of treatment. Now pay, pay attention to this because you're going to hear it again. From one relapse per year to two tenths of a relapse per year. And he says then after the first year, there were continued improvements about 5% fewer relapses per year for the next two years. Okay, let's, uh, let's hear what... And he said, for the first 16 years of treatment, a low-fat diet, the rate of exacerbation, new attacks, or, de or decline was decreased by 95%. In other words, in, in 16 years, actually it continued out for 34 years, if you followed the diet, you had less than a 5% chance of getting worse. This involves 5,000 patients. This involves 34 years of research. These patients were placed on diet beginning actually in December of 1948. 
and uh, as I saw patients, they were added through the years. Uh, one of the first things we noticed was a marked decrease in the evasion per year per patient. <clears throat> During the first year, there was about a 70% reduction in exacerbations, and in the next two years, about 5% each. And we published our first paper long about this time, at which point there was an enormous in decrease in exacerbation rate. We've continued to follow the diet for 16, <coughs> I mean, follow the exacerbation rate for 16 years. Came down to a level which was about a reduction of at least 95%, and stayed down there during the 16 years, and has continued to be that way. So you have a rapid drop in exacerbation rate, and uh, followed then by a very low level of, of exacerbation going on for years. Well, what comes from this, as I see it, is that low-fat diet is very helpful. It can control the disease. If you start it early, patients can have a 95% chance of preventing disability from developing in patients over a very long period of time, 34 years, provided they follow the diet carefully. If they go off diet for any period of time, like months or so, the chances are pretty good that they will begin to get into trouble. And if they're off diet for a long time, sometimes that trouble may not come on for as long as five years, but then when it does come on, it comes on with a vengeance. Okay, well, so why don't people do this? You're talking about spending $30,000 per year on medications that may do more harm than good according to the scheme, versus eating oatmeal and bean burritos and lasagna. Well, why don't people comply? It just it seems like a no-brainer, doesn't it? I asked Dr. Swank these questions. He says, uh, you know, this is in 2004 when we're having a conversation. He says, you know, most people in this country expect to be cured by a pill and to have a cure that is almost instantaneous. With a low-fat diet, the people actually have to work to get better and have to cure themselves. One problem is culture. We are a meat and potato society. Most importantly, there is an economic problem. There is really not much money in a diet. Nutrition has not been taught in medical schools for many years now. So, I was in uh, the basement <coughs> of the uh, building that Dr. Swank works in at the medical school in Portland. One of my visits, you know, as a bookseller. So I was in the basement sitting talking to Dr. Swank. We're having this conversation. And I said, hey, Dr. Swank, I said, you published all these studies. You're uh, basically known as the father of multiple sclerosis. Uh, you publish books. Uh, no one has ever denied that your treatments work. It, it costs the patient absolutely nothing. They save on their food bill. There's no adverse effects. I said, why is it nobody's recommending this kind of diet? When I say nobody, I mean if you go see a patient, go see a neurologist, and then ask about diet multiple sclerosis, the neurologist will poo-poo it. You go to the MS Society, ask the MS Society about diet multiple sclerosis, so they say it's unproven. Besides that, you can't do it. It's too hard to do. Why is that? Well, he, uh, thanks for a minute says to me, John, he says, uh, they didn't discover it. I discovered it here in my, my little laboratory in this medical school. I discovered it. And so because they didn't discover it, they're not going to tell anybody about it. It wasn't their research dollars. I got mad. I got mad at the messenger. I got mad at Dr. Swank. To think that egos would cause people's lives to be destroyed. I got up and walked out of his office angry at him for telling me that. Next weekend, I'm watching 60 Minutes. There's a story uh, in 60 Minutes about the Aeromexico crash over Los Angeles, where this little airplane runs into the Aeromexico jet, and all these people die. And Mike Wallace is interviewing somebody from the aviation industry and saying, well, why, you know, why, why can't you tell when planes are getting close to each other? Don't you have any kind of uh, signaling system, and transponders, and things like that? And the guy from uh, the aviation industry says, oh, yeah, we've had these for years. Well, why aren't they in the planes? Well, he says, uh, the FAA is working on their own version of these transponders. He says to Mike Wallace, have you ever heard of NIH? 
Have you ever heard of NIH? Not invented here. If it's not invented here, it's not important. That's why they're not in the planes. If it's not invented here, that's why you're not going to hear about it in terms of a health and dietary message. You know, maybe someday somebody at Harvard or Yale or Stanford will uh, invent a starch-based diet. Who knows? Figure out how to charge you $50 for a potato. <laughs> These are his exact words. He says, uh, and as far as the MS Society is concerned, John, they don't mention it because they didn't discover it. It wasn't their research dollars that found this treatment, so <clears throat> they're not going to tell anybody. I discovered it in my small office here in the basement of the medical school. So Dr. Swank's my mentor. Uh, he's my hero. He's my teacher. I owe him much. And as a consequence, we started the randomized controlled trial on diet and multiple sclerosis, which we'll probably start studying publishing results on in a year. And we'll show that you can stop this disease. Oh, yeah, there'll be a lot of controversy. You know, they'll say, well, you know, that's, you know, vegetarian diet, vegetarian diet, vegan diet, can't eat that, nobody can follow that, calcium division, protein division, all kinds of lies. They'll criticize the method of the study, even though we've been very careful doing it. It's the highest quality you possibly can. Oh, the method doesn't, it wasn't good method. Oh, we've got to repeat the study. You'll see all kinds of criticisms, but it will be in the books. It will be there for people to read. Oh, sure, Dr. Swank's studies are there. They're in the archives of, of neurology. They're in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. They're in the Lancet. They're there. I mean, he's got dozens of studies published showing this, and they've been published over the last 30, 40 years. But they're not randomized control trials. Ours will be a randomized control trial. Who cares? Who, who cares? We'll just be able to shove it harder down their throats. Something that obviously works and is obviously true. Thank you.